Good to see you all today. Um, would you open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Um, two weeks ago we finished up a study through Elijah that we began in uh, July and then last uh, Sunday the Lord had us uh, through Barry and Isaiah and then now we're going to the New Testament and we're going to be looking at uh, John chapter 8 and, and uh, verse 12. Uh, next week we'll, we will remain in the New Testament. Uh, just a word about uh, the trunk retreat this afternoon. Um, Northgate members, those, those helping, those uh, attending, please arrive a little early um, and park in the back because we're going to have this in the upper parking lot and we want to leave those parking spaces, as, as many of them as possible, for our guests. So um, um, if you'll just note that, come a little early uh, and park in the back. You know, your doctor will be very happy for you getting those extra steps in, um, walking around. Uh, all right, John chapter 8 and verse 12. The Bible says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Let's pray together. Oh, Father in heaven, we come before you now this morning in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we would come in the mighty power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray, Lord, that your Spirit would be upon us today in our hearts. You would speak to us and speak truth. Father, we love you. We pray, God, that you would draw us near to one another. Lord, you would draw us near to you. For these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. O. Henry was a short story writer. He's most famous for a story that he wrote called The Gift of the Magi. No one knows, no one knows that O. Henry wrote The Gift of the Magi. They don't associate the title of that short story with the story. But everybody knows the story. The Gift of the Magi was a story but a young married couple, they were deeply in love. You've heard the story. They were deeply in love. So the young wife loved her husband so much, and she had this long hair. And she loved her husband so much that she decided to cut off her hair and sell her hair to buy her husband a platinum chain for his beloved watch. And he loved his wife so much that he sold his watch to buy combs for her beautiful long hair. And that's how much they loved each other. Well, you've heard that story before. You know that story. It comes from a short story, or it is a short story written by O. Henry called The Gift of the Magi. Well, the the interesting thing is, O. Henry's life was anything but like that story. He had a very, very sad life. He's buried up in Asheville, North Carolina. He had a very, very sad life. Um, he basically drank himself to death. He died of liver failure in 1910. In 1909, his wife left him. So he died alone with no one that cared about him. And when he was on his deathbed, a nurse in the room thought that he had already died and she lowered the blinds. And O. Henry spoke up and said, please don't lower the blinds. I don't want to die in the dark. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is no one has to die in the dark. 
No one has to die in the dark. The Lord Jesus Christ, the light of the world, has come into the world and provided life to all who would receive Him. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. So what does that mean? And what does that mean to you? And what does that mean to us? We're going to look at three truths concerning the Lord Jesus in this one verse this morning. So look first at Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Now look at your outline in your bulletin. This is the second of Jesus' seven great I Am statements recorded in the Gospel of John. And interestingly, Bible scholars have been divided over how this verse fits into the context of chapters 7 and 8. They've been divided over the centuries of how this, how this one verse fits into the story. And some say, and I agree with this crowd, some say that it, it follows naturally the celebration of the Feast of the Tabernacles. If you've ever studied through the Gospel of John, then you know the Gospel of John revolves around the great Jewish feast. That's the timeline. It, it revolves around the great Jewish feast. And the Feast of the Tabernacles had just ended. It was over. The feast was over by now at this point. So the giant candle operas that, that symbolized the pillars of fire that guided the children of Israel through the wilderness to the promised land in the Old Testament, well, these, these giant candles, they were now extinguished. And these things put out incredible amounts of light. In the ancient world, it was dark. They didn't have electricity like we have today. And that's how the Greeks could see the constellations. That's how astrology got so, so much of a big deal because everyone could see the stars. There wasn't much artificial light like we have in our day and in our time. But these candle operas there at the, at the Feast of the Tabernacles, they burned for eight days and eight nights and they put out incredible amounts of light, lighting up the entire temple complex and for much of Jerusalem. So some say, now that this temple was, or, or that this, um, this feast was over, in the absence of that light, Jesus made this statement. Some say, he said, in the absence of this great light, I am the light of the world. Others say, no, 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 no. He was referring to verse 2 of John chapter 8. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. So what happens early in the morning? In the Greek language, that's 6 a.m. What happens about 6 a.m.? The sun rises. That's right. The sun comes up. So as the sun is coming up and as Jesus has just delivered the woman from the hands of the Pharisees who was caught in adultery, he made that statement. As the sun is coming up, he said, I am the light of the world. Well, listen, whatever the context, whatever the context in which Jesus made his claim, he made it very emphatically. He said, I am the light of the world. And there's much more in the Greek, of course, than there is in the English. The Greek adds an extra personal pronoun to emphasize the one who is the light of the world. Literally, literally, a very wooden translation of this would be I, I, and the light of the world. In the English, we wouldn't say it that way. We would say, I myself am the light of the world. But the point is, there's an emphasis on the person who is the light of the world. Jesus Christ is that person. He is the light of the world, and there is no light apart from Him. 
So what does that do? That takes us back to chapter 1 in verses 4 and 5. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So in Jesus there's life, and His life is the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot comprehend the light. You see, darkness doesn't stand a chance against light. Darkness loses that, that, that contest every single time. Light destroys darkness. You go into a dark room and you flip the light switch and you see what happens to the darkness. It's instantly gone. It loses the battle every time. Light destroys darkness. We have so much light around us in our day and time in 2021. But it seems really, really dark when the power goes off. I mean, it seems really dark. And then what do we do? We forget where we put the matches and the candles and we fumble around in the house and we find the matches and we light a match and then we're just always amazed at just how much light that one little match can put out. And then it burns our finger and we have to go find another match and we, we, and we strike another match and then we light the candle, and we, we just stand there. Kids will stand around looking at the candle. Wow, look how much light that one little candle puts out. Well, Jesus Christ is the light. Revelation 21 and 23, the Bible says, the city, that is New Jerusalem, we're talking heaven. The city had no need of, 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 of the sun or the moon to shine in it for the glory of God illuminated. The Lamb is its light. That city, the city of God, heaven, doesn't need the sun or a moon because God Himself illuminates it. Because He is light and in Him there is no darkness. And His light shines in the, in the lives of people who make the decision to follow him. So look, secondly, that followers of Jesus walk in the light, not in the darkness. Look at your outline. Look in your bulletin. We react to light. Or we could say we respond to light. When we've been in the darkness and the light shines in, we respond to it. And we see many manifestations of this truth in life. We see it in our eyeballs. We see it in our eyes. What happens when we go into a dark place? Our eyes dilate. Our eyes dilate. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means the pupil opens to its widest capacity. Why? To allow as much light as possible into the eyeball so that we can see in the dark. In effect, our eyes are starving for light when we're in the darkness. So they adjust themselves. God made us that way. God is an incredible creator. And He made us that way so that automatically our, eye, our, our pupils adjust to the lack of light to let in as much light as, we, as, as they possibly can. You can attest for that if you've ever tried to make your way across a dark room in a strange room you'll get some bruises on your shins that way because you bump into furniture well you know what just as our eyes starve for light in times of darkness friends our souls starve for the light of the lord jesus christ there are so many people around us that are unfulfilled and looking for fulfillment in so many, so many places, and they're so empty. And just as there's no, listen, there's no better light for the eyes to see than the sunlight. That's the best light. The only light that can satisfy our soul is the sun's light, the light of the Son of God. And we respond to that light when it comes into our lives. And then when we find it, we follow it. Did you know that 
that nearly every living thing follows the light? When we lived in North Alabama, when I was pastor there in North Alabama, I went to Birmingham to go to the hospital. When someone had to have major surgery, they had it in Birmingham. And I would have never thought it, but in North Alabama, they grow lots of sunflowers. You ever seen a sunflower seed, a sunflower field as far as you can see? Sunflowers? Well, you drive, you drive past, you're, on, you're on, on Alabama Highway 75, and you're going south towards Birmingham, and you drive through these sunflower fields as far as you can see. And in the mornings, they're all faced which direction? East. And then you come back at the, in the afternoon, and they're all facing east west because those sunflowers follow the sun across the sky they react almost every living things react to the light when our kids were little we came home from church one night and there was a bird in the house now you guys know me by now and you know that i hate birds and I know, listen, hate is a very strong word, but hate fits right there because I hate them. And let, listen, I, the only birds I like are grilled and fried. <laughs> I don't ever want a bird as a pet. I do not like birds. So this bird was in the house, and somehow we had to get him out. And I was back in the bedroom with the door closed because I wanted nothing to do with this bird. That was Tina's problem and the children's problem. And, and so they were trying to get the bird out of the house, and he was just flying around, just, he was, uh, just making a commotion. I could hear it. And then Emily, our youngest daughter, our middle child, just hollered out, turn off the lights. Go open the door to the garage, open the garage door, and turn on the garage lights. And they did, and guess what happened? Just like that, that bird made a beeline toward what? Toward the light. And went right out of the house. And then I came out of the bedroom. <laughs> Nearly every living thing follows the light. So when Jesus said, he who follows me shall not walk in darkness. He meant it. And we need to be careful to note what Jesus was saying here. In the first century, the Jewish people were very inward looking. They were very happy that they were the chosen people of God. But they saw that much more as a privilege than a responsibility. Listen, the privilege of being a Christian can't be separated from the responsibility of being a Christian. This word follows is a present participle in the Greek. It means that the gist of what Jesus was saying here was that he who is committed to continually follow me shall not walk in darkness. So what he's talking about here was, is, is wholehearted discipleship, a wholehearted commitment, not some casual adherence. He's talking about taking up your cross and following Him. Luke 14, 27, these are red letters. Jesus says, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That's pretty clear. And the second half of this phrase is just as Powerful as the first part. When Jesus said, shall not walk in darkness, he meant it. And that little phrase, that little phrase contains what we call an emphatic double negative in the Greek. That means it is impossible in no way for anyone who walks in the light to find himself walking in the dark. You can't, listen, you can't be in the light and in the dark at the same time. You ever tried that? 
You can't. That's impossible. You can't be in the light and in the dark at the same time. Oh, we'll pass through a shadow. We all pass through shadows in our lives. Shadows sometimes become seasons. Sometimes they're events. Sometimes we walk through a dark time in our life, a shadow of a time in our life. But listen, being in a shadow is not the same thing as being where there is no light. You know where there is no light? Hell. The absence of God. There is no light there. True followers of the Lord Jesus Christ will never walk in darkness. Well, thirdly and finally, Christians have the light of life. Now, having the light is not to have the light to shine upon us. It's to have the light to shine in us and through us. Your outline says, the light that Jesus was speaking of here is more than just external illumination. It's life. When we make a decision to give our lives to Jesus, and to trust Him as Savior and Lord of our lives, to receive Him into our lives, the light of the Lord Jesus Christ illuminates every aspect of who we are. When we get saved, it isn't just some part of us that gets saved. It's all of us. I think think it's, it's beautifully illustrated in the Baptist church. We believe in baptism. By immersion. We believe in dipping all of us from our toes to the top of our head, immersing that in the water. To be saved is to be immersed, all of us, every part of our, of our being, to be immersed in the light of Christ. That's who we are, that's our identity. In Jesus Christ. And when we receive Him as Savior, we receive His light in in our lives. in, In fact, His light becomes our life. So we're not talking about turning over a new leaf here. We're not talking about a change in lifestyle. We're talking about a brand new life. So when Jesus Christ comes into our heart and into our lives, He doesn't just patch us up. He doesn't just fix up the broken pieces. He gives us a brand new life. Jesus used the term born-again Christian. Born again. You know what? You know, it's kind of funny. We, we hear from the world. The world likes to talk about us as, well, he is a born-again Christian. What other kind of Christians are there? I mean, if you're not born again, you're not a Christian. That's the only kind of Christian there is, according to the Bible. But the world's so slick about that. Or they'll call us what? Evangelicals. Oh, she's an evangelical. According to Matthew 28 and 19, Christians are evangelicals. And we're born again. And we don't, listen, we don't get patched up when we get saved. We get made new. The Bible says we're a new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Behold, the old things have passed away. All things are made new. All things about us, everything about us is made new when we get saved. If we get saved. And the world likes to cast doubt on the conversion experience of a Christian. They like to call it a religious experience. You ever wondered why? You ever wondered why? Because when, if they can get us believing that we had a religious experience, guess what? 
Muslims have religious experiences. Hindus have religious experiences. Every world religion has an experience. So they just lump us all together. We're religious. Jewish people have religious experiences. I hear it all the time. Do you hear that? Do you hear that in your life? I hear it all the time. My family, not, not, my, not my immediate family, my extended family. You know, I've been in a room before and, and I've heard this, you know, you know, Barry, he's a very religious man. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm saved. I'm born again. That's, I'm, please don't call me religious. Call me whatever you want. Just don't call me religious. Call me saved. Call me born again. Because that's who I am. But the world likes to tell us that we've had a religious experience. And then they condition us to be skeptical regarding the claims of the Bible so that they would have us to reject God and everything about God. And sometimes it's so subtle. Listen, if you go to the university, if your children or your grandchildren go to the state university, they're going to hear this. They're going to hear this. They're only going to hear the truth in a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church or Bible-believing, gospel-preaching family. When they go to the university, they're going to hear anti-Christ things. It's like the, the scientists, these, these Russian scientists. They decided to develop this fish that could survive outside of water, that could live outside of water. So they picked this fish, and they bred it, and they crossbred it, and they hormoned it, and they, and they chromosomed it until they finally came up with a fish that could live outside of water. But they still weren't satisfied. They figured that even though they had developed this fish that, that could survive on land outside of water, it must have, deep down inside of its DNA, this, 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 this desire to be in water, so they kept working. Finally, they came up with a fish that hated water. They came up with a fish that would rather die than get wet. So the leader of these Russian scientists decided to take this fish on a tour. They were so proud. They had developed a fish that not only could survive outside of water, but hated water. Hated the thought of getting wet. And then it happened. They're on this tour. What's the worst thing that could possibly happen to scientists that had developed a fish that hated water. They're on this tour showing off their fish. They're so proud. And then one day it happened. The fish accidentally fell into a lake. And it fell to the bottom. And its eyes were clamped shut. And its gills were clamped shut. It dare not move. It was afraid if it moved it might get wetter. It dared not breathe. Every instinct about that fish said, don't breathe, don't move. But then after a little while, it had to. So it drew in a big gill full of water and its eyes bulged and it began to wiggle all over. It couldn't believe it, it was still alive. It breathed again and it shuddered again and then it took in a third deep breath and then it leapt up, flipped up off the bottom of the lake and darted away. And there went their fish. It had discovered the joy of water. Listen, that's what happens when men, women, boys, and girls who've been conditioned by the world to reject Jesus and everything and anything biblical. That's what happens when men, women, boys, and girls find Jesus, come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. They find the joy they've been looking for their entire lives. 
We live around people who've been conditioned by the world. Just pay attention. You'll see it. It's all around us. We're conditioned by the world to reject Christ. Be skeptical of the claims of the Bible. But just as fish were created to live in water, we were created to live in harmony with God. And we'll never know that joy until we trust Jesus. We won't, listen, we won't have life until we give our life to the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And He's our only hope. And those who've committed to follow the Lord Jesus will never walk in darkness. Those who've given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ have the light of life and their lives will never, ever be the same. If you're saved, you're not religious. You haven't had a religious experience. If you're saved, you've had a true encounter with the living God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And He is the light of the world. Let's pray together. Father, thank You for loving us so much that You would give to us Your Son to be our Savior. That in Him we might have light, and in that light, life. Not only abundant life here and now, but eternal, everlasting life, forever. Father, we praise You for who You are and for what You've done for us. Thank You for Your Son to be our Savior. Thank You for truth we find in Your Word. And Father, may we as Christians encourage one another to walk in light and not in darkness. Father, we love You. And we, and we pray now in the name of Jesus, You would draw us near to You. That You would speak to us right now as You already have. And Father, that we would respond. Every living thing responds to the light. In Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. We pray in your name. Amen. You're here today. You've never truly given your life to the Lord Jesus. Maybe you've had a religious experience. <laughs> you know how you do that? You join a church. You can have a religious experience and join a church. But you've truly never surrendered your life to Jesus. Come today. If you're watching online, give us a call. Call the church. Someone's ready to pray with you. Talk to you. 864-242-3805. If you've never surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, do that today. Find real life, real purpose, real meaning for your life. Or maybe you are a Christian and maybe you're backslidden. Maybe you've allowed the, the lures of the world, maybe you've bought in to some of this philosophy that the world teaches. Repent of that. Repent of that. And turn to the Lord. He's waiting. He's waiting. However the Lord is speaking, we need to respond. So Dennis, you come. Would you stand? Just respond.